So, uh, welcome to the the final module in this in this series. Congratulations on making it all. Uh, my name is Michael Hoffman. I am a principal investigator at Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto, and I'm an assistant professor in medical biophysics and computer science. And I'm going to talk to you today about gene regulation and specifically an understanding transcription factor binding. So I understand as you've been going through this workshop, people are, have not been shy about asking questions. Uh, please continue to, to ask questions if there's anything you would like clarified in the middle of this, this lecture. I also have the today's meet thing open over here in case anyone has a question that they'd rather, rather write down and I can get to that then. So we're going to talk about a number of things today. We are going to learn how to understand how transcription factors bind to sequence in eukaryotic genomes and how to understand the challenges in doing this prediction accurately using computational tools. Uh, we're going to learn how to identify sites for known transcription factors and we're going to learn how to discover transcription factor binding motifs in regions like chip seek peaks or putative promoters using Galaxy and Meme Chip. And that's something we'll do during the during the lab. So there are several parts to this this lecture. I'll talk about transcription and then we will talk about how to predict transcription factor binding sites um, using existing profiles. We'll talk about um, detecting which novel motifs are represented in regulatory regions. So by novel, I mean ones that you don't already know in your database. We'll talk about that a little more, more later. Um, we'll talk about interrogating sets of co-expressed genes or chip seek regions to identify mediating transcription factors. So let's go to, to part one here. So transcription in eukaryotic cells. So we can think of this with this, this very, very simple model. Um, so there's DNA, right, and there is some sort of binding site in the DNA that a particular transcription factor recognizes. So this transcription factor binds to that part of the DNA, and then the transcription factor recruits RNA polymerase 2, and RNA polymerase is what will produce the RNA for a, a gene that is slightly downstream of where the transcription factor is. This is a fairly simple model that informs much of what we do in computational prediction of transcription factor binding. In reality, um, it, is, it is a little bit more complex because you usually have a number of different transcription factors. Right? So here's your transcription start site for a gene. Okay? There will be a number of transcription factor binding sites for each transcription start site, um, you know, the transcription start site itself may not really be one base pair, right? People think of transcription start sites, but often in reality, transcription starts will vary over hundreds of base pairs and it might start at any one of those positions. Um, and then, not only do we have this regulatory region that's proximal to the TSS with a number of transcription factor binding sites, it's also likely that there are distal regions that affect the regulation of this particular gene. Okay. Um, and then, of course, there's a whole downstream set of, of processes that can affect gene regulation, such as mRNA decay, turnover, all sorts of other post-transcriptional regulation like translational regulation that we aren't even going to talk about. But just the process of pure transcriptional regulation is, is quite complex. And the fact that, in reality, none of this happens on a 1D, 1D string like this, but really things happen in the three-dimensional context of the nucleus makes it even more complex. So you can see here, uh, these distal regions, they can, they can affect transcription factors here, or co-activators, and these terms are often used um, 
people are not often precise sometimes when they talk about the difference between what's a coactivator, what's a transcription factor. You know, basically any sort of protein that is involved in the process of initiating transcription, people will often refer to as a, a transcription factor. So, you know, this all the way down here, you know, you can, you can think of this as being maybe tens, hundreds of thousands of base pairs away can affect the, the binding of transcription factors to the core region, the core promoter here. <clears throat> so a lot of really distant things can affect whether, trans whether RNA polymerase actually binds to this region and starts transcribing RNA. Um, the, the other thing that you have to remember is that DNA is compacted into chromatin, right? and here you can see a representation of a number of of nucleosomes and the, pat the pattern of where the nucleosomes are and which regions have open, openly unpacked nucleosomes versus closely packed nucleosomes that prevent transcription factors from gaining access to this region can also affect things. So in reality things can, be, can end up being very, very complex. <clears throat> So to understand this process, there are a lot of different sorts of, of data that, that we can look at that measure various parts of it and the outputs of various parts of this process. So you know, you, you're probably all familiar with, with RNA-seq, which will give you an indication of you know, whether, whether a gene is transcribed and how much it's transcribed. But there are also other assays that will give you a more direct indication of, of how the process of transcription is going. So one of these is called CAGE, Cap Analysis of Gene Expression. And CAGE will, tell, will try to find five prime mRNA caps and will tell you exactly where the transcription start site is for any particular transcript. Right? So this is a little, if you want to find the actual start site, this is a little more exact than, than an RNA. You know, which when, once once you sequence the RNA, you got you might get RNA from the beginning of the sequence, or you might get it from the middle, or you might get it from the end of the gene. And stuff you get from the middle might have already been chewed up at its five prime end. So if you want to have more uh, confidence that you're actually looking at the five prime end of the gene, then you use something like Cage. Another thing that you can look at when you're looking at promoter regions is various epigenetic marks. So you've probably heard of, of these histone modifications which have, are now abbreviated with these very uh, uh, somewhat confusing short, short initialisms like H3K27AC. You know, these marks, th these covalent modifications of histone tails can often be indicative of different kinds of gene regulation activity, whether that's transcription initiation, transcription elongation, uh, transcriptional repression, and so on. You can also do check directly of the RNA polymerase complex. So you can get a measurement not of where the transcript is, but of where RNA polymerase is and potentially working, which is kind of a, a subtly different thing. So those are all things that you can use to understand promoters. Transcription factor binding sites, you can also use ChIP-seq to look at as well. So for example, within the ENCODE project, you can find data sets on hundreds of transcription factors in various human cell types. And you can find locations where these transcription factors tend to occur within one cell type. Finally, these, these regulatory regions, which are sometimes distal from the gene, uh, you can find them using ChIP-seq as well or RNA-seq. So there are epigenetic marks that tend to be present at distal enhancers like H3K4 ME1. Um, there are also co, you know, transcription factors that um, tend to be found at enhancers like P300, which are sometimes called coactivators. You can measure those directly with ChIP-seq. And also, people have found a lot of times that enhancers actually are transcribed into RNA as well. So you can find enhancer RNAs with RNA-seq. So these are all sorts of experiments that, that you can do 
to find these different sorts of data, uh, sorry, to find, uh, find out where these phenomena are occurring, um, there are also things where there have been massive projects where people have, have collected these sorts of data. So, you know, a lot of this stuff, especially for, um, you know, some of the more common model organisms like human, human mouse, uh, Drosophila melanogaster and, and C. elegans, um, you can find you know, through the ENCODE project, um, or you can find through the UCSC genome browser, okay, which is a place where a lot of the ENCODE project data has gone. Um, GEO at the NCBI um, has, in a, you know, it started as a repository for really microarray data, but now there's quite a lot of regulatory data there in general, not just RNA-seq data, but there's also chip-seq data and grow-seq data and any other sort of, you know, something-seq data. Um, one problem with GEO is that it um, can be difficult to make assumptions about individual data sets within GEO that you can make if you get uh, data from something like ENCODE or, or Roadmap. Because all of the data sets within GEO have been created by different labs. You don't necessarily know what sort of quality standards people used. Um, so, you know, when possible, I usually like to go with something that was created by a bigger project that was specifically designed for data release to the community rather than something that was kind of a, a byproduct of a smaller study. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, I, I, that's, yeah, that's, that's a good point. So Francis, Francis says it's true for, for anything, and I, for Jen Bay. Yeah, I think it's, um, I would say, I, I think it's even more important for something like like ChipSeq because there there is just so much more that can go wrong. I think when you when you're doing something like ChipSeq than than when you're just you know sequencing a genome. So if someone deposits something in you know GenBank and it ends up having you know Phi X one seventy four sequence in the middle of it, you know it's fairly easy to 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 see that uh, you know you can see that things have gone wrong. Um, and it's only like, you know, one sequence, whereas if you're looking at a ChIP-seq data set, you know, the whole thing, they could have used the antibody that, that, you know, completely failed and the whole data could be, you know, a huge data set could be totally useless. So be very cautious. But in general, yeah, community resources, I think, are, are better to use. Um, so Roadmap Epigenomics Project is something you probably saw the release of, of uh, several papers from this project a few months ago. So they did a, more than a hundred different cell types in um, hundred hundred different human cell types. Um, a lot of these are actually primary tissue rather than um, immortalized cell lines. Most of what they did is chip seek on um, histone marks, um, some measurements of open chromatin, um, some methylation data. They did relatively little of the transcription factor chip seek that I've been talking about from ENCODE. Uh, and finally, Oregano um, is a, a website that has, um, so it's open regulatory annotation. It has lots of different sorts of data collected for a number of different sorts of organisms. Can people in the front hear that? Okay, I can barely hear it. I think I think I need my hearing checked. Um, oh dear, what happened here? Okay, well I already mentioned the the overview, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, so we'll move on to to part two here, which is learning how to predict transcription factor binding sites. So quite simply, it's teaching a computer how to find them. Um, so let's look at a number of different ways to represent a transcription factor binding site. All right, here's one way. You might have this sequence, and you have some data 
you know, maybe maybe the data came from chip seek or chip exo or it came from some in vitro technique like protein binding microarray or Celex experiment. You know, this is a transcription transcription factor binding site. <clears throat> you, in most cases, knowing that this one sequence is bound by a transcription factor does not give you license to search the rest of the genome to find identical identical sequences and look for transcription factor binding sites that way. So transcription factor binding is very degenerate. All right. So just like you know in the um, you know, protein, the translation genetic code, you know there are a number of positions, usually third positions in a codon, that can change and be. Um, you can result result in the same um, amino acid being added to a, a peptide at a certain place. There are a number of positions within any given transcription factor that are degenerate and can change without the transcription factor um, caring about it very much. So just having a single sequence does not really give you that, that information. Um, <clears throat> So if you look at a number of binding sites, so let's say you did some, some um, selects experiment um, and you get out a number of binding sites for a particular transcription factor, you can see kind of intuitively there, there seem to be some similarities between these different positions. For example, there always seems to be TT in the fourth and fifth position. There always seems to be A in the last position. But some of the other positions change of it. So another way of representing this is as a single consensus sequence. All right. So you um, you might be con you might be familiar with this alphabet. So this is called the IUPAC um, IUPAC ambiguous DNA alphabet. All right. So in, in addition to having A, C, G, and T, it has other letters that will represent every possible combination of A, C, G, and T. Right? So for example, you've probably seen N, which is the, the representation for any of A, C, G, and T. Um, and there are other ones like R, which means a purine. So R means A or G. Y means C or T. Um, S means um, C or G, you know, there, there are a variety of different, different things like that. They're kind of hard to remember initially, but they all have their, their kind of mnemonics. Um, and that can represent things. But what it doesn't really do is it doesn't tell you that, you know, a particular, a particular site within this, this motif um, can be A or G, but it's almost always A. Or it's like a seventy-five percent of the time, um, or you know, it's usually a. And if it's actually G, that means you'll have weaker binding of that particular transcription factor. So what we do instead is we develop a a more complex mathematical model called a position frequency matrix. So you can take all of these sites here, and in every particular column, you sum up the number of times you see each one of the symbols in the unambiguous DNA alphabet. All right, so you can see here, you know, 14, um, 14 A's in the first column, three C's, four G's, et cetera. Um, and you can go on, go on like that. And a position frequency matrix, this is just the simplest way of representing it without having any sort of model uh, underlying it. But there are a number of different ways you can transform it, and one way you can transform it is into this graphical sequence logo representation that gives you, at a, a glance, an understanding of which bases are most important for this transcription factor uh, to bind, given the data you have. Right? So I mentioned that the fourth and fifth positions are almost always T. You can see that here, that there's a T in the fourth position and T in the fifth position, and they are some of the highest, um, the highest letters within the sequence logo. Okay, so that gives you an indication of how much information that you can get from a T being present in a particular position. Okay. So 
in practice, people who are generating models of transcription factor binding usually start with a position frequency matrix, but usually transform it um, in one of a number, number of ways. So here's one particular transformation into something called a position-specific scoring matrix, or PSSM. You'll also see similar sorts of transformations into something called a position weight matrix, or PWM. Um, the, <coughs> the difference between these is not always well-defined. So you know, really, if, you, if you're writing a paper and you're talking about a position weight matrix, it's important to say you know, what you mean by that, uh, what sort of um, assumptions were built into your model, because people won't necessarily know which ones of these were, were done. Um, oh, I see. This is, this is kind of a Mac PC issue, isn't it? Um, this equation got a little messed up. So a variety of different ways of getting it. So um, selects is a in vitro selection procedure that you can use. Um, so it used to be the main way by which people determined transcription factor binding preferences in vitro. Uh, and the way this works is you will have a, a pool of random oligonucleotides, um, and you will have your, your purified transcription factor, and you will use that to essentially pull down um, a subset of this pool. And then you will simply replicate the DNA within this pool. Um, and then do the selection procedure and do this whole thing like six to ten times or something. So it's kind of a in vitro, you know, not natural selection, but in vitro artificial selection procedure. And the sequences that are left at the end are the ones that tend to bind the transcription factor pretty well. Um, so it introduces some, some biases. Um, and so... Uh, and is kind of time consuming to do. So, you know, most of the large scale experiments people do these days that develop, that, that end up with uh, transcription factor motif models come from a protein binding microarray instead, where you have a, a chip and you put down oligonucleotides, you put down every possible, like, ATMR, basically, and then you are able to measure the intensity of a protein oligo interaction all at once for the whole chip, and then you can generate a PFM straight from that. Okay. Um, so I see these are, these are here. Um, can I, can I write on this? Okay. Um, so let me just rewrite this, this equation. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see it. Still not sure if you guys can see that, but you get the the idea. Um, basically, the the conversion here is a way of of modeling various sorts of factors that you should keep track of um, before you do a genome wide scale. So the first thing people do is so the the um, the F here um, is. Um, the original frequency. So FB of I is for a particular base at a particular column I. And then you add a <coughs> um, you add a, a factor, this S of N factor, that waits for the confidence of that particular particular pattern. All right. So if you only have one sequence, you aren't going to have a lot of confidence that your pattern is, is correct. But if you had, say, hundreds of, um, hundreds of short sequences that you know represent this uh, motif, you're going to have a lot more confidence. So you can add that into this here. And then you divide by P of B, the particular base you're, you're talking about here, because <coughs> you want to be able to score things relative to their actual frequency in the genome. 
right? So if you see um, C and G a lot more often in some genome than A and T, you need to keep that um, you need to keep that in mind in your model. And if you see that, then seeing a C or G at a particular position will be less surprising, which means from information theoretic point of view, it has less information. So the final thing that you do is you take the log log of this, and that just makes um, all of the arithmetic a lot easier um, because if you, t you put things on a log scale, um, then you can essentially multiply them times each other in the original scale um, just by adding them together, right? So, you know, in logarithmic space, um, adding, sorry, multiplication becomes adding, um, division becomes uh, subtraction, and when you're working with a lot of probabilities, as these are, you're going to need to do a lot of multiplication and division. And <clears throat> you may not realize that computers are, you know, like, they seem like they can multiply any number, but they're actually a lot better at adding and subtracting than they are at mul multiplication and division. And if you convert things to log space, you can make, make things go hundreds of times faster, and you can stop worrying about certain sorts of numerical problems that you get otherwise. <clears throat> so here we can show how you can use a particular PSSM to, to scan the genome. Right, so here is the PSSM for, for the SP1 factor. Right, so we have the sequence logo representation. You know, when I see this, I think of it as equivalent to a PSSM. Here's the actual PSSM for that, that sequence logo. You can see at positions um, you know, three and four, you can see a much bigger, um, you can see a much bigger number for the G row. Um, in this last position, you can see a much bigger column for the T row, and so on. So this matrix can be used to score every particular um, set of, in this case, what is this, timers in the genome. All right, so here's one timer. Um, you can just add up all of the scores for each position each base in the genome and the way it matches each row column combination within the PSSM. Right? So the grayed out ones are what you're actually, uh, the darker gray ones are what you're actually adding up here. Um, and in the end, if you add up all these numbers, you get 13.4. <clears throat> so you can do, there are a number of different ways of, of doing this. Um, and I probably don't need to go into them. Uh, but in the end, you can convert something like this um, to a, a p-value. So you can get a p-value for any particular, um, any particular potential binding event between a transcription factor as modeled by a PSSM and any particular sequence. And you do that by comparing against um, what sort of scores you would expect if you if you do this across the whole genome? Um, so you know the question was asked earlier about you know where you get these these initial um, data. You know, do you need to be able, do you need to do a CLEX experiment yourself? Um, thankfully, there you know are a number of these in the literature, um, and there's also this great website called Jasper Jasper.genereg.net. Uh, and you can look at Jasper, and Jasper will have a number of different transcription factor uh, motif files that you can just download. And so you got lots for vertebrates, for for Drosophila, for you know they have a plant section, um, anything that they can find in the literature, they end up adding to to Jasper. So this is very useful for doing these sorts of experiments. Any questions so far? Okay. So now we have uh, a model for transcription factor binding, uh, and you know there's software, and we'll talk a little bit later about the software that you can use to do this sort of analysis yourself. Okay, <clears throat> how well does this work in practice? Well, there have been a number of of experiments where people have done. So here's these are just a couple of examples. But one experiment where 
these people, Crunch and colleagues, did a in vitro binding test. Um, and they found that 96% of their predicted, of the sites they predicted computationally were actually bound um, at, according to their experiment in this in vitro test, right? Which, you know, as, as someone who develops predictive models, I think 96% 96, 96 accuracy is really, really good. And Gary Stormo um, found in some biochemical studies that the position weight matrices match really well um, to a biophysical interpretation of how transcription factors and sequence interact. And so, you know, you can see PSSM scores, PSSM score gets higher, uh, binding energy uh, improves as well. Um, so that, that was really reassuring. So essentially forms a biophysical basis for the working of these models. Okay. So that's the good side. <coughs> Bad side is that, and this is just one, you know, again, one of a number of examples that find something like this. You know, if you develop a MyOD profile uh, with in vitro data, you will find that it will predict binding sites one every once every 500 base pairs, um, and you know, this means you'll find one about 20 sites per gene. Yeah. <coughs> and the ugly. If you look, if you look at the human alpha actin gene, and you use a number of different transcription factor uh, binding site profiles, you'll find good predictions all over the gene. Okay? So, literally, and you can repeat these sorts of analyses genome wide. You know, literally the entire genome is is littered with things that look like they're good transcription factor binding sites according to this this model. Okay? This, this gives rise to uh, what Wyeth Wasserman called the futility conjecture, which is that transcription factor binding site predictions are almost always wrong. Um, so this model works very well in, in vitro, um, but it can work very poorly um, in an actual uh, chromatin context. Okay, so this, this goes back to the, the introduction to uh, transcription that I talked about earlier. Okay, you can have a very simple model where you just have transcription factors interacting with sequence, uh, which actually describes very well what happens in, in vitro. And so the model works very well, and the model can make very good predictions. But once you throw in all of that other stuff, you throw in lots and lots of sites. You throw in the possibility for long-range three-dimensional um, distal interactions. Uh, you throw in chromatin structure. It makes this a lot harder. <clears throat> What's worse is that adding stringency doesn't necessarily, necessarily help. So you can't just say, OK, I know that most of these predictions are bad, so I'm only going to take the predictions with the highest possible, highest possible score. Uh, because as it turns out, um, you know, there's no, there's, in vivo, there seems to be very little um, relationship between you know, the score beyond a certain level and whether a binding site actually is, is real. Okay? Again, this is because there are a lot of different factors that aren't incorporated into the, the binding sites at all. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a sticky problem to deal with that we'll talk about a little, a little more in a second. Um, but first, I'd like to summarize this, this part uh, where we essentially bring you the football of transcription factor binding prediction, and then I take it away uh, because it's too hard to do at the moment. Um, so position-specific position scoring matrices can accurately reflect in vitro binding properties of DNA binding proteins. Um, but the binding sites are way too frequent to, to actually use on their own. Okay. <clears throat> so yeah, we can talk a little, little more later about some strategies to to get around this. But are there any other, other questions on the first couple of parts before I move on? No questions? OK. Um, so before, before we get back to that, 
um, let's talk a little bit about <coughs> ways that we can find transcription factor transcription factor um, binding sites de novo. Um, so, you know, this is a slightly slightly different problem. But say you have a number of regions. Say you have a, a gene list, for example, and you know for some reason that everything within that gene list is coordinately regulated, and you want to find whether there is some some motif that occurs um, more more likely than you would expect by chance within those particular sequences. All right, so here we have three sequences. Here are three very similar short sequences that you find within these larger sequences, and we want to be able to find those. Okay. Specifically, we want to be able to find um, not just one motif, but perhaps a number of motifs. We want to be able to find the widths of those motifs, so we don't necessarily know that they're, say, eight MERS to start with, and the locations of the motif occurrences. So this is actually still a really hard problem uh, computationally. It's nice that I can you know, do a version of some of this stuff within a few hours today, whereas when some of these methods were first developed, it would have taken, taken days on much smaller data sets. It's, it's still hard because the input sequences are really long. So we'll have thousands or millions of base pairs. Um, and the motif may be highly degenerate. Okay, so it's not a matter of simply finding sequences that you find um, that match each other, but you also have to deal with the fact that there are all of these possible uh, positions that might change slightly from one position or another. Um, and it's like finding a you know, faint wisp of a, a needle within a huge haystack. <clears throat> so let me make this example a little more, more concrete. Um, so. Let's, let's say we have a number of co-regulated genes, okay, and we're given a set of promoters. In this case, maybe we'll just take the annotations of these genes and look 500 base pairs upstream and say, OK, these are, these are our, our promoters. Um, and we want to find a transcription factor that binds to positions that are unknown to us. So we don't have anything like ChIP-seq data, for example. And we also need to remember that they can, they can be on either DNA strand. So for the most part, transcription factors are not really strand specific. Okay? Um, so you know, in most cases, and there are definitely there are exceptions to this, like there are for everything in, in biology. But you certainly need to deal with the fact that in most cases, the transcription factor does not care which strand it's, it's binding to. Um, and the RNA polymerase machinery does not care which strand the transcription factor is bound to. The transcription factor just simply needs to be there somewhere um, to drive transcription. So you have to deal with the fact that you know, we might have a motif here that's on this, this strand, okay, but we might also find the reverse complement of that same motif. <coughs> and the transcription factor does not see a plus strand and minus strand of DNA like we do, it just sees DNA. And to it, this looks the same as, as this. Okay, so we need to find, find this as well. Um, and we are going to assume that, this, that the motif of this transcription factor can be defined by a PSSM or, or a PWM. So our problem is to discover the motif given just these sequences. Okay, so we don't have any of that data that I showed you before, such as the individual sites are here, there, or, or wherever. Uh, we just have these big sequences and have to find this in the haystack. So there are a couple of, of different techniques that people use for this, this sort of thing. Uh, one is called expectation maximization. I'm going to show you a, a simpler approach called, called Gibbs sampling. Um, <clears throat> which is the other main technique used for this. Um, so Gibbs sampling involves essentially guessing an initial weight matrix. Okay, so you need some sort of starting point. And the way you do this is you, um, you pick parts of the sequence at random. And I'll show you that in more detail in a second. So you get an initial weight matrix. 
right? And then you use that weight matrix to predict instances of, of the described motif from your weight matrix, right? And then you use those instances to essentially refine your weight matrix and you repeat this process over and over again. Okay? So this is actually a fairly common, <clears throat> this sort of technique is fairly common used in de novo discovery of all sorts of things within within computational biology where you have some sort of guess and then you refine it and then you try you know maybe a different guess and you refine that and you see what gives you the best score overall. Um, it works a lot better than just doing a total random guessing um, and a lot of times the search space for these processes for, for these problems is so big that it's not possible to do any sort of exhaustive search. Uh, but you can find that there's some threshold, at, you know, by which if you make enough guesses, you are, you know, you can reliably get a result that is fairly close to the, to the good result most of the time. So I'll go through this in a little more detail. So this guessing step, and you don't just make up a uh, position weight matrix entirely. Um, you start by taking sequences. You, you take random subsequences within the set of input sequences you're given, um, and you use those here to sum up, and you use those to make a position frequency matrix, and you convert that to a position-specific scoring matrix, or PSSM, as, as we've, we've shown you before. Okay. So you do that, <clears throat> and then you will throw away one particular one particular instance okay? and then you will um, the remaining the remaining instances will define your your position weight matrix your position specific scoring matrix and then you can use that to define a probability um, so scoring with your new newly guessed and then refined uh, position-specific scoring matrix at each position of uh, another input string, and you can pick a new sequence according to the probability distribution, and in the end, you, pick, you return the highest scoring motif that you've seen. So another example of this, so you end up throwing out one of these instances, you, def you redefine the PWM or PSSM uh, just based on the ones that are left. Here this is a slightly different formulation of position weight matrix where the individual columns all add up to 1.0. Again, these things are all kind of equivalent to each other, just a mathematical transformation. Um, and then using this matrix you can you can score the sequence that you've taken out, right? And then you will take whatever is the, the best scored position um, within this sequence, the sequence four, and you'll add it back in, and you'll you'll keep repeating this process. Okay. So you can you can do this, and then in the end you'll get a Genova motif. Um, you will get a uh, position weight matrix, and you'll have a sequence logo of um, this thing that you think is responsible for coordinate regulation of the the genes you're looking at, which is which is great, right? So, so now you have a figure for your, your paper, um, and in the old days, I think people, that, and when I say in the old days, I've certainly done this myself, you know, look at this sequence logo and then, you know, compare against your own knowledge or maybe look through Jasper at individual sequence logos and kind of scroll through it and see whether you find someone, that, one that kind of looks similar to what you found. Um, Nowadays, we have a nice tool that does this instead. It's part of the meme suite, which is called TomTom. Tom. So after you've discovered a motif de novo, you can compare it against a motif database, such as, such as Jasper. And it's kind of like an alignment for, uh, for motifs, for transcription factor motifs. Uh, and it will give you a score for, for each potential motif in the database that this matches. And you can say, okay, this, these regions all seem to have the MIC motif, and, and you know you can report that in your paper. Yes? So the 
Yeah. So the question was, how how long are these motifs? Um, so usually people are looking at motifs between say six and and twenty base pairs. Um, the the ones that are really well defined. I think are usually between six and 12 base pairs. So when I see a much longer motif, like the 20 base pair ones, there's usually quite a bit more um, degeneracy in those. And I think you'll probably see some, some, you know, say 20 base pair long motifs within, within the lab. Um, often what's happening within these longer motifs is really you, you have what could be better characterized as two shorter motifs. Maybe there's a, you know, uh, a dimer of a couple of zinc fingers or something, and, and it's, it's rec you know, recognizing one motif, and then there's a spacing, and then you know, 10 base pairs away, it's representing another six, six base pair motif. Yes? Yeah, so the question, the question is when you're doing de novo discovery, uh, do you end up with one, one link at the, at the end, right? Is that the question? Um, so in general, no. Um, you know, so I think this is something you can set when you run a de most de novo discovery mo motif tools is whether you're going to, what sort of limitation you're going to place on the particular uh, the length of the motif. But usually what you get out of something something like meme or dream um, is you will get what it thinks the best motif is. And there, there will be some statistical correction for, for the length of the motif. Uh, but, you know, if you have something that's truly a, you know, transcription factor that really recognizes an eight base pair motif well, um, if you find a 12 base pair motif instead, usually that will not give you a lot of extra statistical confidence, so that won't be reported. So in the end, these things will report the best motif. Really, they'll report a, a list of the top in best motifs, either you know, the, the motifs that pass some, some certain threshold, maybe it thinks has a p-value of less than 10 to the minus 4, for example, um, or, you know, maybe you get the top 20 motifs or something like that, and they're going to vary in length. <clears throat> okay. Um, let, us, let us move on. Um, are there any other questions on this, this part before we move on? Okay. We will move on then to the, the next part, which is um, looking, getting more uh, specifically at the question I just, I just introduced, which is to find a regulating transcription factor for sets of co-expressed genes. Okay. So let's take some gene expression data we have here. This is a really old school microarray, but we might also, you know, have the same same sort of data from, from RNA-seq. Essentially, we just have a set of expression values, whether it's transformed from microarray or it's RPKM from RNA-seq value for each gene. Um, and then from that, we can infer a number of genes that are co-expressed and those that are, are negative controls. Right? And we want to be able to figure out whether the co-expressed genes have some particular motif in common. Um, so whether this, say for example, you have this motif, you can discover whether it's here, 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 and it's not any of your negative controls that don't exhibit the same sort of co-expression um, co -expression phenomenon. Um, so what we can do is we can look for enrichment of a particular set of transcription factor binding sites. And this is very similar to looking for enrichment for, for go terms for a set of genes, um, except it's a lot um, more focused on the sequence. So, you know, for, from a sequence and transcription factor guy like me, it's a lot more satisfying in some ways. So we're just looking for enrichment of a particular motif, and then you can make other inferences. You can follow, follow things up from there. 
So here are two different examples of, of ways you can do this. One, so we have this foreground set of co-regulated genes and we have this background set um, that aren't regulated in the same way. So one is you can look for um, the motifs that show up in the most numbers of genes. Okay, so, so for example, uh, most numbers of genes in your foreground are not in your background. So here's a theoretical transcription factor binding site, this blue motif. You find an example of it in each one of the foreground genes and in none of the background genes. Okay. Another, another way you can do this is you can look instead for the most number of instances of a particular motif. Um, so you might find a motif that occurs with relative frequency in many promoters or even throughout the genome. So for example, you'll find it in all of your background negative control sets, but you find it more often in your, your experimental, your co-regulated genes. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of, of this talk, you know, often it can be clusters of transcription factor binding sites that can be more important than finding something something one time. And depending on the way a particular transcription factor works, uh, you might find one or the other of these approaches are better. But in general, you know, I would be far more impressed to see something where you where you find a transcription factor binding site, you know, twenty times before a set of genes and one time before the rest of the genes, and ones where it's just here they here once and not here the other times. This is something that is much more likely, I think, to occur by occur by chance usually. So there, there are a couple of different statistical tests that you can use. You can use a binomial test to do this to do this sort of analysis based on the number of occurrences of the transcription factor binding site, the number of individual instances, or you can use a Fisher's exact test to do this based on the number of, of individual genes. Um, and thankfully, you don't have to code this up yourself. There are a variety of, of tools that will, that will do this for you. Uh, so one of these tools is called Opossum. Um, Opossum is available on the web, and so you can test this out there with your, your own set of genes. Uh, you can take a set of express genes. Opossum will take your gene IDs and automatically retrieve the, the appropriate sequence from ensemble. It will do phylogenetic footprinting optionally, which means you can limit to only those positions um, within your transcription factor binding site which are conserved. Um, it will detect transcription factor binding sites using the sort of PSSM uh, methods I showed you earlier in the JASPER database, right? and then it will, will do statistical testing of the, of the significance of these binding sites using either a Fisher's exact test or a binomial test, and then you'll get a, a list of mediating transcription factors. Okay. So here's one particular example of, of using opossum where there are a number of genes that were identified as muscle-specific and a number of genes that were identified as liver-specific. And I used opossum to see whether there are any sequences, motifs, for identif previously identified transcription factors that could be used to discriminate between these two sets. Uh, and what they found here was the top, the top hits uh, by the, the binomial method, okay? So this is the method that looks at the total number of instances uh, within each gene rather than just the total number of genes, where these genes SRF, MEF2, CMIB, MIF, TF1, and so on, these red arrows indicate that there's, there's experimental evidence that these transcription factors are, are um, active within muscle anyway. Um, and over here you can see a similar example for liver. You can see the top hit is the HNF1 motif, uh, which I assume is something liver related. I'm used to whenever I see H at the beginning of the transcription factor, it usually means hepatic or hepatocellular or something. Yes? Sorry, I can't the program looks so wet. 
So the question is, what region, what sequence is this actually looking at when you upload the gene list? Yes, it will, it will look at the promoters of these, these sequences, uh, sorry, of those particular genes. So it will you know, actually download them for you. So if you're using opossum, you don't actually need to supply the sequence, you just supply the gene list. So that makes it a lot simpler. Can you write? It is so noisy back there, I think it's that new. Can you designate the regions? I think that you can, uh, yeah, I think that you can specify how much of a promoter you can, you can use. You can also do this, so, so this is a screenshot of the Apostum web server. You can also do a sequence-based um, analysis uh, where you just supply sequences instead. So if you want to construct your own pipeline with Galaxy or on the command line and upload a set of sequences, you can, you can any arbitrary sequences, you can definitely do that. Yes? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, what if a gene has alternative promoters? What what will it do in that case? So I must confess, I do not actually know the answer to that question. I can tell you that um, you know a lot of bioinformatics software they will try to um, limit to one um, one sequence per gene, right? So they will pick one one transcript, uh, be because alternative promoters is, is a relatively common thing, right? So if you're doing any sort of bioinformatics analysis on promoters, where you define promoters as 2,000 base pairs upstream of a gene or 500 base pairs or whatever, you always have, almost always have this problem of defining, you know, where is the actual promoter region? Um, and so usually people will do things like they'll pick the longest transcript, or they will uh, pick uh, the, the TSS that is most upstream, um, and then they'll use that as the, the region. And I don't know what they do in Opossum specifically, but that's what I would, would guess. If you start having to deal with multiple promoters for a particular gene, um, the statistic certainly becomes a lot more complex. Any other questions? Yes. What was the question? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so Opossum has a variety of different options. I, I usually, you know, start with with the the top thing here, uh, the top site. The, the third one here, this transcription factor bunny site cluster analysis um, is interesting as well because it looks for um, it looks for close together clusters of transcription factors instead of just looking at whether they occur within the um, within the sequence um, anywhere. So that one can be can be interesting as well. Um, so the the Anchored versions are more for looking at particular combinations. Um, so if you think it might be, you know, not just one transcription factor, but, you know, a heterodimer of two acting uh, together. Um, you know, often though, you know, if, if things work, a couple of transcription factors work as heterodimers, um, and often, there will already be an entry within the Jasper database um, for that particular heterodimer, a sort of heterodimer motif, um, which is certainly not to say that everything is in there. Um, you know, most transcription factors are not in Jasper or, or TransFAC yet, but I'm not sure how many things that um, are in there that you know you would miss otherwise that you would only get with one of these anchored versions. So. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna try this, it's probably you know it's probably worth trying several several different versions of this. There's very little cost to it, um, and see what you get from each of them. Yes. Everywhere you have the last one. 
No, all of the others are um, sequence based as well. Um, the other ones just um, it's the other ones are easier because you only have to supply a gene list, and the software will do things like figure out what the appropriate sequence is for a human or a mouse or a fly, um, select the appropriate subset of Jasper, and maybe do you know maybe find. Um, conserve regions to compare against as well. So the sequence specific version, you know, that just means that you can do any sequence for any species. It just means that a little bit more of the pipeline will have to be constructed by you uh, rather than relying on a lot of the stuff being done for you, like in the human or, or fly case. Um, you know, and I know from, from looking at the attendee list, there are people here who work on other species and you know, I'm afraid this is often a a common thing. Is you know, stuff stuff is you know, pipelines are already set up, and you know, annotations are made, and things are done for you. And the the human world that you know, maybe they they aren't as often. If you're say working on even a common organism like zebrafish, you know, let alone something that you know is is studied by a smaller community. Um, other questions? Okay, um, so here's a, a um, interesting interesting thing, which is that there are transcription factors that are structurally similar. So there are families of transcription factors, like the ETS transcription factors, um, where the proteins bind to highly similar motifs. Okay, so there are exceptions like the zinc finger family, uh, where zinc, fam zinc finger family is renowned for its uh, diversity, and there are a couple of different residues that can change and greatly change the the binding motif. Uh, but in other cases, you know, you'll find a um, so so this is the ETS binding binding motif as in Jasper. Okay, and there are a variety of different matrices or sequence logos for other ETS proteins here. Um, and they are all very similar, even though they come from slightly different proteins. Okay. So the, the question is, um, you know, when you have this huge family, um, what, what can you do? Um, on the Possum website, there is there is a or nearby on the Possum website, there is software called ChopGene um, that will um, help you pick out which one of these it may be responsible. Um, but in reality, I'm not sure you know how much it matters. Um, in most cases, if you found that something is related to ETS, that's what you're going to know about it. Um, and it's going to be hard to figure out, you know, which particular submember of the ETS family um, is being bound here without actually, um, without actually doing a experiment yourself. So that ends this, this fourth part of this, this lecture. We've been going through this pretty quickly. Um, any questions before I go into the last part of the lecture? Okay, we we'll move on to to part five. Okay, um, and this gets back to the the problem I identified uh, earlier, which is that you can make all of these transcription factor binding predictions in bulk genomic sequence, and it doesn't necessarily mean something. Um, so there are a variety of, of different ways to try to um, understand the context, the genomic context of a particular binding site. Um, we want to do a integrated analysis that includes not just the sequence that might indicate some transcription factor binding but also utilize other data we have, such as epigenomic marks, or chromatin accessibility data as determined by DNA-seq, or, or a tax seq 
Um, and there are a variety of methods that, that you can use to, to do this. Uh, I'll talk about one segue, which is near and dear to my heart because it came out of my lab. Um, so segue um, will partition the whole genome into a number of different classes. Okay, so we'll use data from ChIP-seq experiments from ENCODE or Roadmap or something similar and DNA-seq or ATT-seq or FAIR-seq experiments and then it will make a, a decision uh, for every, every region of the genome of what kind of regulatory function it has. Okay. Um, so it will call a particular region as maybe having regulatory activity or will call a region as having as being transcriptionally repressed or to call a region as um, you know being a distal insulator or something like that um, and with this sort of information you can focus on particular regions when you're doing uh, transcription factor binding site analysis and then you know you'll only be limiting to those regions that might possibly have um, a transcription factor uh, binding to them, and that might actually have a biological effect. Okay? It's unlikely to happen in regions that you can call as heterochromatin um, from, uh, from a variety of ChIP-seq type data sets. Um, so that's one tool that you can use for this sort of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, the question is which which order do you do this in? Um, so in general, Segway is something that will, and many of these tools, will limit the part of the genome that you need to do your analysis on. So you would do that first. Um, but a nice thing about something like Segway is usually it will already be done for you and you can just download these annotations for a particular something. Like you can go to the Segway website and you can download a Segway annotation for, you know, uh, liver cells, or you can download one for myeloid leukemia cells, or, or so on, and then only focus on those smaller regions of the genome when you're doing a particular uh, motif scanning analysis. Yes? Does the annotation you mentioned already in the lab some public are they annotations in something like Clinvar or, or Anivar? No. Um, so these are a little, these are a little different um, than something like Anivar. So first, they, they cover much bigger uh, proportions of the, the genome. So as I understand it, Anivar, you know, will... Um, have a call for various positions in the genome and say, you know, this has been, um, you know, this has been described as causing this particular um, phenotype. Uh, Segway will will divide the entire genome up into regions. Okay? So every every region in the genome will be called as either repressed or transcriptional or dead or something like that. Um, and yeah, but the other thing about it is it is you know based on these sorts of chip seek experiments, and it's an inference that's that's made made from all of those different experiments and previous experience and previous knowledge about the way chromatin works. Um, so it's much less tied to individual essentially stories at individual positions. So. Clinvar and Anivar are much more, as I understand them, uh, point related, um, and this is something that attempts to describe everything. So um, another interesting tool is is called GREAT, uh, which is from the Bejarano lab at Stanford. Um, so GREAT is something that you can use to um, to tie a set of, of regulatory annotations you have, you know, say you know that a particular set of regions is important 
um, to, to you know, understanding some biological problem, but you don't necessarily have them all tied to particular genes. So, you know, one thing you could do is you could do some sort of motif search in these regions. Another set of, another thing you could do is you could um, put them into GREAT and do a GREAT analysis. Um, and GREAT will essentially assign each region to a, a nearby gene, which, which isn't, um, by all means, is not a perfect solution to this problem. Um, but for now, it's often the, the best sort of thing we, we have. So in GREAT, you can take a bed file indicating a particular set of non-coding regions. I mean, they don't have to be non-coding, but this, but it, it, you know, it is designed to work with non-coding sequence. So if you have some coding sequence in there, that's fine. But you wouldn't want to use this if you were mainly, if you could mainly identify genes from your sequences to start with. Um, and it will look at various sorts of of attributes that you can associate with particular positions here um, and give you, uh, there's a website that will give you this sort of, of, of output and you'll get a list of various sorts of um, properties that are enriched in the sequences um, that you have specified. Okay, so those can be things like uh, gene ontology terms, and there are also a variety of other properties that are also that are also in great. Yeah. So the the question the question is for a more specific example of what you can use great with. Um, so. What's that? You cannot do it with XM data. With XM data. No, you certainly couldn't do it with XM data. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a good example of sort of, you know, and for example, you know, let's say you are, are chasing after um, some particular set of, of energetic RNAs um, that seem to pop up under a certain set of conditions, right? And so you're able to map these RNAs back to the genome. You know, they're all um, long coding and energetic, and you want to see whether the genes that they are nearby um, have some particular thing in common. So are they, you know, you know, genes that have to do with a certain biological process, uh, genes that, that tend to be associated with a certain sort of tissue, that sort of thing. That's what you can scrape for. So the question is, how does it how does it do this? Because you're providing a sequence. Um, so what you're you're providing, you you aren't providing a list of genes. So my microphone is off. Oh no. Okay. Can you? Should I just wait? I I can shout, but if this won't be picked up on the. Uh, So let me, let me answer your first question first. Uh, so the, the, the first question is, um, you know, how does, how does this work when you upload a set of sequences instead of a gene list? So you aren't actually uploading a set of sequences. You're uploading a, a bed file which has a set of coordinates related to some genome. Okay, so um, in some ways, this is and distinguishable from a, a set of sequences because those coordinates you uniquely define a set of sequences. But importantly, they're related to that particular particular genome. Okay, so those set of sequences, basically what GREAT does is it will take a set of sequences for 
energetic reasons, and it will create a gene list, and then it will do some sort of analysis on the gene list. So this means that your, your bed file of these coordinates, it has to be in one of the, the genomes that, that GRADE already understands and, and has um, annotation for. You know, you can't, you know, there's no, like, sequence-based mode that I know of, at least, for, for GRADE, because all of the, the, the data has to be uh, assembled um, for, a particular, um, for a particular species. Um, one of the nice things about transcription factor binding analysis outside of this is that, you know, often you can learn, you know, if you learn a transcription factor motif on mouse, it's probably applicable to human as well. You know, it's probably applicable to most other vertebrates. These transcription factor motifs are usually very well conserved, um, whereas this sort of thing, you, you wouldn't be able to do it as much. And your question was whether you could use this for any particular RNA, uh, RNA-seq analysis. I think it would depend greatly so on, on what exactly you found from an RNA-seq analysis. So one where you're tending to find protein coding genes, this probably wouldn't be the best tool for it. Probably be better to use um, the sorts of tools that were described earlier in this workshop. Uh, but if it is something that gives you predominantly um, non-coding alignments and you're kind of struggling to figure out, you know, how do I get a, a gene list from this, right? Basically, you know, when, you, when you're in a position where you have a set of sequences or you have a set of regions and you say, I don't know how I'm, you know, I want to analyze these as if I had a gene list, but I can't get a gene list from this. That's essentially what GRADE is for. It will, will kind of make the gene list for you and then, then do the analysis. Um, was there another question? Yes. So, even if you provide a gene list or a bed file, it always like go back to four other the same uh, the sequences from the same database. Great. You're asking about great. Uh, either a segue or great. Okay. Um, so the question is, if you supply a a gene list or a set of sequences or coordinates. Will great go back and and get things from the database? Great will, uh, you know. Great will, you know. There's always a database tied to a great analysis, so you need to supply um, some sort of set of sequences or coordinates that are related to one of the existing great databases. Segway um, is both software and it's also a set of pre-computed annotations available for that software that have been produced by that software. So most of the segue um, annotations that have been pre-computed for you um, are uh, from human data, right? Um, so there, and there's also a worm, there's a worm and a fly cross species segue, so that's available as well. Um, segue is not like a web server in the same, um, same way as, say, Great or G Profiler or one of these other tools, you know, what you get, what you get is an annotation file, which is essentially is a, a bed file that you can then import into Galaxy and do all, all sorts of other analyses with. So it's a, a little different, but in general it's going to be something that you'll use as input to another one of these methods or even just to display on the genome browser um, rather than something that you can upload particular sequences to and it will work with. Yeah, my question is actually, if they're they always going to pull the same data set if you provide the same bad file or same gene list, but if you have some like mutations in your uh, disease group, then you will miss, it will miss uh, because you always pull the same sequences. You're asking what the effect of mutations in your uh, in mean, your initial data set are. For example, if you get some uh, interest in back regions that there's difference between your case and control, then you go back to look at uh, uh, motif, different motif. Maybe there's some mutations caused by a different binding size. Yeah. But since you already you don't use that information, but you all yeah. 
So the question is, what happens when you uh, when there are, say, point mutations within your uh, this the sample that you're using for input, right? What will happen with with great and some of these other tools? Did I get that right? Right. So yeah. How you get so so great, you know, great will not consider that because great mainly uses annotations that are tied to particular uh, genes, much like GProfile or any of these other uh, geneless tools. If you use something like opossum or like meme chip it will consider that because there you're, you're going to be supplying a list of sequences rather than you know a list of coordinates or or genes um, and uh, opossum or meme chip will work directly with those sequences so if you actually see differences in your sequence because of a mutation uh, that will be picked up by 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 meme chip so other questions okay um, we'll try, yeah. So let me just mention another couple of things and we'll, we'll finish up. Um, so one is interactions between transcription factors. So you asked the question about, you know, what, what length are these motifs usually, you know, I mentioned that often you'll find, um, heterodimers. Um, you know, so in addition to the heterodimers that you'll find sort of pre-existing in motif databases, um, it's also possible to discover these um, de novo within your data set. Um, so the meme suite, which we'll talk about a little in the lab, um, has a tool called SPAMO. Right? And SPAMO stands for spacing of motifs. Um, is a tool that you can use to find whether there are two motifs that tend to be spaced by a similar amount each time. Right? So if you can imagine two transcription factors, each with their own motif, and in some particular set of genes, they are always configured so that one is, say, you know, binds eight base pairs downstream of the other, this is the sort of thing that you can pick up with, with a, a tool like SPAMO. Um, and we're running short on time, so I won't talk about any more detail here. Um, so I want to wrap wrap up here now. Um, there are a few few big challenges ahead in in developing transcription factor binding site prediction further. Um, one is the question of understanding all transcription factors. So you know there, and say humans there are you know, 1,400 to 2,000 transcription factors. We have motifs for several hundred of them. Uh, it's not enough to get a complete picture of everything, so we need a lot more biophysical data uh, to understand all of these things. Uh, two, we want to understand how genetic variation in regions of transcription factor binding sites um, affect transcription factor binding. Um, Third, a really important question is how to best integrate all of the epigenomic data that we've been gathering over the last decade or so. Uh, and fourth is, you know, whether we should be using more sophisticated models for transcription factor uh, binding in the first place. You know, those models work very well for for naked DNA, uh, but there's a, you know. There are a lot of things that they still don't represent. They treat each column as if they're independent probabilistically uh, when we know they really aren't. Um, so in the end, there's a lot of um, complexity within the eukaryotic nucleus, and there's a lot of things we have to, to understand. We're getting large-scale data on a lot of these a lot of these different aspects of, of chromatin biology. So it's becoming more and more possible to understand this in a way it wasn't, say, even you know, three or five years ago. But we still have, you know, as, as scientists who want to understand how transcription factor binding works, we have a, a long road ahead of us. So I just want to sum up, you know, mention a few, few take-home points from the lecture. You know, one, is even though we have good models for transcription factor binding in vitro, uh, we have to remember the futility conjecture, which is that you know those those predictions in and of themselves 
um, are not all those useful um, and that we need to use other techniques such as conservation, such as you know, epigenomic data that can be summarized with something like Segway, such as looking for clusters of transcription factor binding sites um, to find those that might be biological meaningful. Um, second is that looking for a transcription factor binding site uh, enrichment can be used to help us figure out what is responsible for patterns of co-expression. Um, and third um, is that we are going to need to, in the future, um, use a lot more epigenomic data in order to solve all of these problems. And there, there are uh, methods being developed that, that um, will do this, but it's still a, a long road ahead of us. Um, so that concludes this, this lecture. Uh, I'm happy to answer any more questions. Um, if you want to ask questions during the break, that's fine too. So.